good morning, everybody. Good morning. Beautiful morning. Happy Father's Day, everyone. Our first song this morning will be 642. 642. I'm resolved in the Red Book. We'll sing one more song, 584, 584, in my heart there rings a melody.
Good morning. Good morning. We are in the book of Acts this morning. Chapter 6. begin with prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your love and your grace in our lives. We thank you for this wonderful weather that we've had, and we pray, Lord, that um, as we meet together today, we can glorify you. We thank you for the privilege of coming together, and we ask that you just bless our time now as we study your word and reflect on the things you have to tell us. We pray in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Chorus, Canar, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And these represented, uh, these presented, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. An opposition rose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen, brought him before the Sanhedrin, and they produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, in the beginning of the sixth chapter here, we see some problems uh, that the early church was having. And uh, they were problems that happened, you know, uh, because of the growth in the church. I mean, God is adding to the, the church daily, it says. Those that were being saved in chapter 2, you know, we were told that 3,000 uh, were baptized into Christ. And so the church starts off with 3,000, and then uh, uh, we're told in chapter 4 that 5,000 males uh, became believers, and who knows you know, how many women and children there were besides, besides the males. Um, so within a few weeks, you know, we're up to several thousand, maybe 10,000 or so. So that's a pretty big church, right? Now, when you have that many people, you know, you're going to have problems that, that need to be dealt with. And uh, so, you know, the Spirit of God begins to, to deal 
with those issues as, as they begin to be addressed in the church. And one of the issues within the church was this division culturally in these different languages that were in the church. That the Hebraic Jews, you know, most of them lived in and around Jerusalem. Um, you know, they were the conservative group. They were the true blue Jews, you know. Uh, then you had these, uh, these Grecian Jews. And, uh, you know, they, were, they had been scattered throughout the world. And, uh, you know, most of them spoke Greek because uh, Greek was the, the known the main language of that day. That's why the New Testament was written in Greek. So kind of like English is today, you know, most cultures uh, learn English as a second language, like my wife did when she grew up in Romania. She learned English as well along with it. And so in that day, it was Greek. You know, Greek was kind of the language that you would learn along with whatever language, you know, that your, your family and your heritage spoke. Um, and so the, there are these two groups, the, the Jewish, the, the Jews that uh, grew up in Jerusalem, and they were the Greek Jews, Orthodox, and then you had the, the Grecian Jews. So there were these two groups, and they were trying to get along. You know, they, they were one family now in Christ. You know, they were all baptized into Jesus Christ, and they were... They were one family, but they still had these, these issues because, you know, they, they come from different backgrounds. And uh, so the complaint was, the Jews were saying that um, when they were distributing the food, remember they were, people were selling their properties and they had this uh, fund, this church fund, and they were distributing it as anyone had need. Remember we talked about that. And so the, the Grecian Jews are saying, you know, that uh, the, uh, the Greek widows, they're being overlooked. You know, all the food's going to the Hebraic widows and not as much to the, the Grecian widows. And so, you know, there was this tension that was beginning to start. And so if the church leaders, you know, hadn't dealt with this in the way that they did, there could have been a big problem in the church. So the, the 12 apostles, you know, they step forward and they, they address this issue. And they basically, they appoint more leadership within the church. You know, 12 guys trying to deal with 10,000 people. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing. Now, some of those people probably weren't there anymore. They went back, and, you know, um, in the day of Pentecost, you know, when the 3,000 were saved, some of them had just traveled there for the day of Pentecost and they probably left. So that we don't know exactly how big the church was. Some of them had gone home um, and they were taking the gospel with them, you know, wherever they, they lived. But it was still a big congregation, however big it was. And tr these 12 apostles, you know, it was too much for them to do everything. And so... Um, they, they said we need to, to pick uh, seven men that were full of the spirit and wisdom, and it should be their responsibility to, you know, deal with these kind of issues when they come up, while the apostles can concentrate on, you know, studying the word and, and devoting themselves to prayer. So they chose these seven men, and the, the two qualifications for these seven um, were that they were to be full of the Spirit, and they were to have wisdom. Now, it's obvious from this verse that being full of the Spirit was something that you could observe, right? It was something that the rest of the church could see. That's why they voted for these guys, because they said, choose seven that are full of the Spirit. Now, they all had the Spirit of God within them when they were baptized. But seven men that really stood out, that the Spirit of God, they were just full of the Spirit of God. So they were known for this. It was something you could, you know, observe in their lives. Now, when we think of being full of something, it, it, that's something that characterizes a person, right? Like when the Bible talks about somebody being full of anger. 
that's something that kind of dominates and characterizes their personality, right? When they're, when they're full of anger. Or a person that might be full of joy. You know, whenever you're around them, they're just bubbling over with joy. They're just so full of joy that it's oozing out, you know? Um, it just, it describes uh, who they are. Or someone that's full of deceit, you know? Is someone always trying to lie and deceive you about something? And that comes through their personality. Or there's several characters in the Bible that were full of pride, you know? And that's evident when you're around them. They're full of pride. You can see that. So it describes, you know, a, a characteristic. They have this trait, this personality trait about them. So someone that, you know, is full of the Spirit, they're not getting more of the Spirit, but they're allowing the Spirit within them to control them, to characterize their personality. They, they're letting the Spirit of God take over. Because, you know, the Bible talks about how you can quench the Spirit, and you can grieve the Spirit, but you can also be full of the Spirit by letting the Spirit take control of every aspect of your life. Now, in, back in chapter 4, when we, we talked about Peter, in chapter, Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people... If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how uh, he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. For salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which you must be saved. So Peter, full of the Spirit, you know, he speaks here with boldness, with clarity, with power, right? And Peter was controlled by the, the Spirit of God, and he was able to deal with this situation as he stood in front of the Sanhedrin. And this is something that Jesus actually prophesied when he was with them in the upper room. You know, he said, when you have to stand before the officials, the Spirit of God will come on you and give you the words you need to say in that moment. So Peter, you know, was full of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, even though we weren't there, it's also evident to us, right? Because we remember him at Jesus' trial when he was arrested. And Peter was scared of his own shadow. You know, he was scared of a little girl coming up to him and asking him if he believed in Jesus or if he was a follower of Jesus. You know, and he couldn't even witness and stand up and give a testimony to this servant girl. But now here he is in front of the Sanhedrin. This is the power of all of Israel. And he's full of the Spirit. You can tell by what he's saying and the boldness that he has. This is the same Peter, right? So it's evident, even to us. It screams out of the page to us, even though we weren't there in person. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul tells the believers to be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek text, the verb, be filled, is actually in the continuous present tense. And what that means is, he's basically saying, be continually filled with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So we need to continually be filled with the Spirit, like letting the Spirit can take control of our lives. Again, not quenching the Spirit, not shutting Him out, but allowing Him to have control. And these, these seven men in Acts, they were known by the people to, to be full of the Spirit. This is something that really just characterized their lives. The Spirit shone through, and it was evident to, to everyone. So Stephen is one of these seven. Uh, verse 5, it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, it says he was full of God's grace and power doing great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. 
Over in chapter 7, verse 55, it says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen, over and over again, talks about him being full of the Spirit. And he was full of faith. And he was full of God's grace. And he was full of power. So he, there was many things that characterized his life. He's an example of someone that's really sold out to Jesus. Um, now, verse 3 also tells us that these men were full of wisdom. They weren't just supposed to be full of the Spirit, but also something that they wanted to be a characteristic of these seven men was that they were full of wisdom. You know, they had discernment. They had good judgment, you know. They were sensitive in dealing with problems and with people and things like that. Um, so it was the wisdom, you know, that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives you that wisdom. In James chapter 3, James talks about the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom from heaven. And uh, he talks about that and he says that that wisdom is, first of all, pure then peace-loving, it is considerate of others, it is submissive, it is full of mercy and good fruit, it is impartial, impartial, and finally it is sincere. That's the wisdom that comes from above, and this is the wisdom that was supposed to be, you know, that characterized these, these men. They had discernment, they had, you know, a sensitivity in, in dealing with people, they were impartial, you know, they were full of mercy, peacemakers, sincere in the tasks that they were uh, to do. And, uh, you know, the kind of man who could go into this very situation that we're talking about with this tension between the, the Greek Jews and the Hebraic Jews, you know, and be that, be that peacemaker, you know, between these two parties and be considerate of, of both sides. And the needs that they have. Um, so these seven need to have the wisdom from above to, you know, appropriately deal with these things. And, uh, and with Stephen, we're also told that uh, he was full of faith. You know, that he, he fully trusted God and he believed God. He was a man of faith. Which makes sense because, you know, Hebrew says that without faith it's impossible to please God. So he was a man that was, that was full of faith. And in the definition of faith, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it tells us, Faith is being sure of what we hope for, and it is certain of what we do not see. So, you know, trusting in God's promises and trusting in the unseen, the spiritual things, the things that God has, has spoken about. And uh, so a man, of full, a man that's full of faith is um, someone that trusts the Lord, but he's also faithful because faith and faithful are the same word in the Greek as well. So it's not only somebody that trusts in God in all things, but who's trustworthy. You know, he was a, a faithful, trustworthy person. So to say that, you know, Stephen was a man full of faith is also say, say you know, he, he, he was full of faithfulness. He was a reliable person. You know, he was somebody that you could depend on. And then notice in verse 8, we're told in there, another characteristic of Stephen here that he's full of God's grace. He gave people the benefit of the doubt. You know, people like that, full of God's grace. They're always gracious to you. You know, he was a man that knew what it was to receive God's grace. When you really know what it is to receive God's grace and you're appreciative of that, you're able to give that grace to other people. And so this is something that also uh, was characteristic of Stephen's life. He was full of God's grace. He showed grace to the people that he came into contact with. In verse 8 also tells us that he was a man full of God's power. It says that he was able to do great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Now we're not told specifically what those miracles were. 
But like the 12, you know, he was given this gift, a gift of the Spirit to perform miracles. Now, it's interesting that the seven that were chosen, they had to be full of the Spirit, and they had to, have to be full of wisdom in order to wait on tables. You might think, well, they were overqualified. Just to wait on tables, right? Um, but, you know, waiting on tables is a very humble job, right? And uh, it's kind of like washing feet. It, taking care of the needs of widows, it, it's difficult if you're not humble. You, because you have to share their burdens. You have to take care of their concerns. You have to be compassionate. You have to have kindness. So it was a, a humble job. So being full of God's spirit, you know, is the first and foremost thing you need to have if you're going to be a true servant of the Lord. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 10, 43, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So even Jesus played the role, you know, this humble servant waiting on tables. And if anyone was full of the Spirit, it was Jesus, right? Uh, but his role was to serve others, not to be served, even Jesus himself. And he said, to follow me, it's about serving people. If you want to follow me, well, you need to get in your head that you're going to be serving people. Because that's what following Jesus is. So yeah, waiting on tables is exactly the right job for someone that's full of the Spirit. And somebody that has wisdom. Because it means laying down your life for people that you come into contact with. And, and Jesus gave us the perfect example, you know, when... Up in the upper room, you know, he took off his robe and he, he, he played the role of the servant. And he washed all of the apostles' feet. And Peter even resisted because he thinks, you know, well, you're too, this is, you're overqualified for this job, Jesus. You know, you shouldn't be washing someone's feet. But Jesus said, I need to do this. He, he was a servant. He gave his life. And he gave, as he adds in that verse in Mark 10, uh, 43, he said, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And that was part of it that goes along with that as well. Giving your life away. And we'll see that Stephen also does this. In the next chapter, you know, he's willing to lay down his life for Jesus and for the sake of the, of the gospel. You know, just doing whatever it took. So someone full of the Spirit, you know, is going to have a Spirit's heart. And going back to that verse in Ephesians 5, you know, when Paul talks about being filled, with, continually being filled with the Spirit, the context is about serving each other. And he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes into all these different relationships. He talks about uh, wives submitting to their husbands as to the Lord, and husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And children, you need to submit to your parents and obey them. And fathers, you need to treat your children well. And, and you know, employees, make sure that you obey your employers because act as if you're serving the Lord. You are obeying the Lord. And employees or employers don't take advantage of your employees. So it's all about how we treat each other and serving one another. And it just fits in that context. So being full of the Spirit, you know, it's about, it's going to bring out also giftedness. And that's one thing that we see in Peter, I mean in uh, Stephen. He had many gifts, obviously. But one of the gifts that he had was, was miracles. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was trying to think about, you know, we know the twelve did miracles. But it seems that there were three others besides the twelve that was given this gift of miracles. Stephen, we're told here, performed miracles. Philip, who's also one of the seven, he performed miracles over in chapter 8. 
And Barnabas, in chapter 14, verse 3, we're told both Saul and Barnabas performed miracles. So we know at least three, Stephen, Philip, and Barnabas, uh, had this gift to do miracles besides, besides the twelve. Yeah, Jerry. One thing about uh, Saul and Barnabas and uh, the seven. Uh-huh. Before they got sent out to what they were going to do, the apostles laid their hands on them. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And I think that's important. I think that, you know, that's there's something to be said about that. Laying your hands on someone. Um, I know they do it in when people are uh, going through an ordination. They lay their hands on them. and um, So there is, uh, you know, a spiritual transference. You know, I think that happens, you know, when you pray and also lay your hands on someone as we as we see in that in that context, especially that they were they were given this this gift to go out and do the work that they needed to do to be these missionaries. And yeah, and God gave them this gift of, of being able to do miracles. Um, but also another thing that the, the fullness of God's spirit enabled Stephen to do was to be this bold witness for Christ. Just as we saw back in chapter 4 with Peter, you know, how it changed him and he became this bold uh, preacher. And even in the face of the Sanhedrin, he had that boldness. Well, Stephen also, we won't be able to get to it today, but next week we'll talk about that. He gives this big sermon. And uh, he just has this boldness to, well, first of all, and we're told in this chapter, in verse 9, that he was being a bold witness in this synagogue of the freedmen. And it's evident from the places that they, that they came from that this was a Greek-speaking synagogue because it names the different various places that they were from, and they're all Greek places. And so Stephen, you know, he, he begins to debate with some of these men, and then look at what it says in verse 10. It says... But they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So the spirit of God, you know, was in him, speaking through him. Once again, just like it happened with Peter. And But this frustrated these men because they couldn't win the argument with, with Stephen. So then what do they do? You know, they tried to take him down another way. And so it says that they... they uh, Manipulate the situation here. They start stirring up the trouble with the people and with the elders and with the teachers of the law. And then if that wasn't enough, it says that they also brought false witnesses to testify against him. Sounds a lot like what happened to Jesus, doesn't it? You know, stirring up the people and then also bringing in false witnesses, you know, to make sure that he's condemned. In fact, most of, some of these men, you know, were the ones involved with, you know, putting, handing Jesus over to the authorities. And uh, at the end of his speech before the Sanhedrin, it says they, they looked intently at Stephen, that his face was like the face of an angel. So he was definitely full of God's spirit. They could even see it, you know, just as looking at him. You know, he just had this radiance about him. And so, you know, being full of the spirit definitely has a lot to do with just having courage and boldness in your faith. And, um, you know, it, it took, it took a, a lot of courage for Stephen to, do, to stand up before these men in the synagogue and then later with the Sanhedrin. And, uh, you know, he, he stood with his moral convictions. He didn't let anybody persuade him. He didn't let the fear of men get to him, just as Peter and John and the other apostles didn't let that happen with them as well. But it, it was just, you know, he was so bold. And then also, what we're going to notice from chapter 7 is the fact that Stephen also was just full of God's word, wasn't he? When you read that chapter 7, I mean, it's basically uh, an overview of the whole Old Testament. <laughs> you know, he just breaks the Old Testament down and gives the main plot lines, and, and he knows the word of God. He's just sitting there rattling off all these things that are in his head. He knows, he's studied. He's a man that has studied the Word of God. And so, you know, 
If we're going to be full of the Spirit, one of the things that we need is to be immersed in God's Word, you know, just to be saturated with it. Because then the Spirit of God is going to use that. He's going to use that Word that we've studied, and He's going to, you know, and when we're in these kinds of confrontations or just opportunities of sharing our faith with people, the Holy Spirit, you know, will recall those things that we've studied in the Word of God and then be able to use that in our witness uh, of Jesus Christ. So all of these things, you can see that Stephen, you know, just had all these gifts, but he was just a man that was, he was sold out to, to, to Jesus Christ. And so, um, and then, you know, even at the, the end of his life, you know, just the fact that he was willing to lay it, lay it down. For, for the cause of the gospel. He wasn't afraid to die either. And that also just shows that the Spirit of God was really inside this man because he didn't let fear, even his own life, you know, he wasn't afraid of losing his life. If it meant, you know, giving the glory to God and promoting the gospel and standing up for what is right, standing up for truth. And that's something that we're starting to face in our culture, you know, just standing up for truth and what's right. And, you know, there's going to be persecution that's going to come our way for that. But we know we need to be ready and we need to be able to stand firm. So, well, there's more I could say, but we'll close it up there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. We thank you for all the things that you've shown us in the life of Stephen especially, but also just in the church as they're learning to deal with problems and situations that arise in the church, just that they uh, were able to just, people were able to come forward and take part of the, the leadership in the church and just uh, to expand that leadership and to deal with some of the problems that were coming up in the church and then how these men just see how their lives just took off when that happened and they were just really sold out to you and they were able to do all these, these wonderful things and so Lord I just pray that we can be men and women who just let the spirit really take control of our lives and we can shine and be bold witnesses in our faith and uh, for the gospel of Christ we pray as we go into worship now and give us the hearts and minds we need to have as we look at your word and as we sing, uh, praise your name this morning. We pray in Jesus' name.